back and better than ever. It is those guys. I'm with this guy, Nick Ferguson, joining me. I'm Alex Hardy. And before we really dive into a post-Super Bowl environment, an NFL season that's come to a wrap, uh, Nick Ferguson, I wanted to start with you because you were in Las Vegas. Uh, and, And just tell me about your experience there and how... From the time you were playing, the NFL wanted no business with this city or anything to do with gambling. And now, what has this event become where they host the draft, they host the franchise, and now they host the Super Bowl? Well, I'll tell you what. It is funny how money changes the situation. And, and you're right. The league did wanted no part of Las Vegas, but eventually they saw that there was too much money to be made, and we both know the league loves one thing and one thing only. And God we trust. And legal tender do we trust. So they took advantage of it. All you have to do is look at the groundbreaking numbers as far as sports book betting that took place in Las Vegas. I mean, earth shattering. So this benefited Las, the city of Las Vegas and the NFL well. And I have to tell you, I mean, Vegas was great. I mean, how could you not love Vegas. It is called Sin City for a reason. And there's so many people who embark on Vegas every single weekend. This was just another weekend and just so happened an NFL game was taking place that Sunday. So I had a great time. It was fun. I saw a lot of players, a lot of uh, celebrities. And oh, by the way, Alex, it's one of the only sporting events that you see an eclectic group of people. You see your average Joes, you see your broadcast media superstars. You see football superstars, the who's who of, of entertainment and music. There's no better place than being at a Super Bowl. And yes, oh, by the way, you can make a crap load of money in Las Vegas betting <laughs> on what? Guess what? Football. And that's exactly what happened. Well, it's one of those cities that has supported so many, not just sporting events. Uh, I mean, F1 came to Vegas, right? But yeah. at the same time, it, like you said, they, they have the infrastructure, the hotels, certainly. They could have so many of these events that football is just kind of, you know, uh, not a side effect, but it's just sort of another event that takes place in that city. Would you put the Super Bowl in Vegas every single year? Well, I wouldn't put it in Vegas every single year. I mean, just think about that. Vegas every single year. The level of temptations can lead to so many things that could go catastrophically wrong. But maybe every four years in Vegas, I think they can do that. Because, like you said, they have the hotels. They have the infrastructure. Just the catwalks going from hotel to hotel. And make, and the idea that everything is pretty much on the strip and the things that were not on the strip they were not that far away. So it's an ideal place that none of us thought would ever happen. I know Paul Tagliabue right now is saying, you know what, Roger, <laughs> I would have never done this, but somehow you've been able to pull it off. Well, we'll check in with you this time a year from now after you spend some time in the Big Easy, and I'm sure there will be no complaints about going back to New Orleans for you, Nick. Uh, in addition to yourself, the stars, the celebrities, everyone that was there, there were a pair of football teams there to play a game. And the Kansas City Chiefs, of course, winning Super Bowl 58. Uh, we talked about what a big deal it was for, for Patrick Mahomes and, and, and Taylor Swift and I guess Travis Kelsey and some other guys <laughs> on that football team. We'll get to the winners in a minute here, but I wanted to start with the losers, Nick Ferguson, and whether it's the Philadelphia Eagles or I mean, virtually every other team other than the Kansas City Chiefs that went on to win multiple Super Bowls, you had the Super Bowl loser getting that hangover, and now all of a sudden there are questions being asked. Now, a team you're very intimate with, having spent time on that coaching staff, your San Francisco 49ers that reached the pinnacle of their success because of you, Nick, are now wondering (laughs) if they can get right back to a Super Bowl. It was four years uh, since they went the first time, but they have a unique formula with how the team is built, and it starts with having the cheapest quarterback in Brock Purdy. I'm very excited to quiz you with some of the guys getting paid more than Brock Purdy next year, but I just want to open the floor for you, Nick. Um, How long, or I guess how much longer, is this Super Bowl window open for the San Francisco 49ers, having just lost to the Chiefs. 
Well, I'm going to say the window is uh, definitely open. We know how things work in the NFL. They close as quickly as the B-gap on the inside draw or a handoff. <laughs> but when you think about the San Francisco 49ers, and you hear the, the nail on the head, it's about the culture. They've proven that it doesn't really make a difference who's at quarterback. Four years ago, it was Jimmy Garoppolo. didn't work. Now they have Brock Purdy, who's, I guess, getting comparison to the great Joe Montana him, himself. Yeah. As, long as, as long as you have some of your core pieces intact and you have the brilliance of Kyle Shanahan, the team is already always in it. Now the question becomes, based on what's happening with the San Francisco 49ers under head coach Kyle Shanahan, is he becoming frustrated? Is he becoming restless with the fact of getting his team there and not being able to get over the hurdle? That is going to be the biggest challenge for the San Francisco 49ers. And oh, by the way, I mean, the team has been able to maneuver their roster as far as paying guys, knowing as though they have a quarterback on a rookie deal. So what happens with Brock Purdy? So for me, Brock Purdy is severely underpaid. I think he's making less than a million dollars. And oh, by the way, that dude is one of the top quarterbacks from an efficient standpoint in the NFL. And guess what, Alex? He has a roommate. Just think about it. He <laughs> loved roommates in college, but he's a grown-ass man. Yes. A roommate as a grown-ass man, so that means that the 49ers are going to have to pay him. And that is going to take a little of the edge off because once they pay Brock Purdy, as they should, what happens to Debo Samuels? What happens to mm -hmm. Brandon Ayuk? All those guys are going to want to get paid, and rightfully so. The window is still open based on the brilliance of Kyle Shanahan, but they first need to find out what they're going to do in free agency, not, not in free agency, but as far as signing their own guys once free agency starts uh, around the corner sometime soon. But if yep. Brock Purdy puts his foot down and says, I want to get paid, that changes the window, but I still say that window is still open. There's a lot to unpack there, and I'll say the window is wide open for one more year because after his second year on that four-year rookie deal as Mr. Irrelevant, the final pick, 262 in the 2022 draft, uh, there is one more year that he plays on that rookie deal, and he's eligible for extension talks come 2025. So for this next year, the 49ers are in great cap position because of the, the importance of their quarterback and how little that he's making. Again, um, 850K, I think it's just about a million dollar cap hit for 2024. Let's name some quarterbacks that are uh, going to make more money than Brock Purdy for next year. Ready, Nick? Yes, let's go ahead. We'll, okay, we'll go with uh, the last quarterback uh, to pilot the Dolphins, not named Tua Tungavailoa. That'd be Skylar Thompson, making more than Brock Purdy. <laughs> how about... Um, drafted in the third round, but never played a snap in his rookie season. That's Hennon Hooker of the Lions. Yep. You've got Stanford Cardinal and former starter of the Houston Texans, Davis Mills. I don't know how he lost that gig to C.J. Stroud. You've got the heir apparent for Tom Brady. Uh, nope, never mind. That's Kyle Trask. And your guy <laughs> making more than twice the amount of money that Brock Purdy is. He was there in San Francisco when you were, and he started three games for the Vikings. Who am I talking about? Uh, you're talking about Nick Mullins. Nick Mullins. 2.2 milli, well-deserved. But again, when you have that type of um, cap for a starting quarterback, we'll see what they can get done. The next piece of that, you mentioned the wide receivers and Debo and Brandon Ayuk. Ayuk is entering the final year of his rookie deal. And playing not necessarily in the shadow of Debo Samuel because they're, they're operating in different roles, but you've got a lot of advanced stats guys and fantasy football guys that say, you know, he runs, runs one of the most elaborate route trees, he's open all the time, he wins in contested situations. Um, and you, he's also getting the praise from Sauce Gardner, who was tweeting some of the IU haters. He only had three catches in the Super Bowl. He only had three catches in the NFC Championship. He was lucky that the ball bounced off the Lion defender's helmet, and he made that catch to set up the touchdown. Uh, here's here's a Jets All-Pro corner, Sauce Gardner, on Twitter the other day. Ayuk is one wide receiver. I see who gets open the majority of the game, but don't get thrown the ball. 
and he can win in contested situations. So if he's not wide open, he should get the opportunity to make the play on the ball instead of throwing it away. Now, that kind of praise from that kind of player, your assessment of Brandon Ayuk, and is he someone that's a cap casualty because he's thinking he can get money out there like A.J. Brown, Tyreek Hill, all these guys did previously, despite sort of playing behind Debo Samuel in the pecking order. Yeah, he is a guy who wants to be receiver 1A. And right now he's 1B to Debo Samuels. And he's proven, even with that catch deflecting off the DB helmet from Detroit, from the Detroit line, Mm -hmm. that concentration and focus, he was right there on point. And oh, by the way, in that same game, it was Brendan Ayuk that helped deflect a breakup or early, it would have been interception from one Brock Purdy. So there's a lot of value there for Brandon Ayuk, and everyone wants to be paid. They've already made several trips to the Super Bowl, so Ayuk wants to be paid, and rightfully so, because life in this game, I can tell you, is very short. And your window to make money is even shorter. So when you come off a team and, and you have gone to the Super Bowl, team wants to, other teams want that Super Bowl experience, and why not Brandon Ayuk? And once again, that's going to be the tough part. How are you, as Kyle Shanahan, going to convince, you know, Brandon Ayuk to stay in San Francisco knowing as though, uh, I mean, the cost of living is higher than the giraffe ass. And once again... (laughs) Yeah, Brock knows. Yeah, and and, and you want to find, as a player, you want to carve out your own niche. You want to carve out your own legacy. And I'm sure Brandon Ayuk wants to do that. He would love to stay in San Francisco, but he's asking himself, Alex, Is the window closing? How long do we have? Because just like we said, once Purdy gets his money, that's going to change a lot of things. So if you can get out ahead of it, if you're Brandon Mm -hmm. Ayuk, move on to another team and get paid, then you can say, at least my family would be set up for the remaining of their life. We want to give your young quarterback as many weapons around him as possible, but we also know that part of the strategy um, to winning a Super Bowl is winning that battle of the trenches, Nick. And looking at the eligible free agents uh, with this 49ers group, the one that really jumped out to me was on the defensive line. And they they made the, the trade deadline moves for Chase Young and Randy Gregory, who are on expiring deals. Of course, you saw Randy up and close in Denver. But they also had Javon Kinlaw, Sebastian Joseph Day, Cleveland Farrell. Um, Kinlaw, obviously, being a star on that line, but other depth pieces that you know, constantly being to rotate rushers and that being the strength of their defense, if they let three, four of those guys go, um, now it may be turning into a weakness without having the kind of depth behind, you know, the super, super stars like like, uh, Nick Bosa. So would you prioritize, can you juggle prioritizing a receiver like Ayuk while keeping the depth of that defensive line among one of the league's best? Well, for me, looking at who's your OC, and we're just talking about culture, you would prefer to be have a bevy of weapons, and that would mean keeping IU. But they've shown that being the 49ers, they added Chase Young through trade. They acquired mm-hmm. Randy Gregory. So the idea is that they can do that again. The one thing you can't get is guys on the offensive side of the ball that really know your system inside and outside. So if you're Kyle Shanahan and you're looking to prioritize, you're trying to do that on the side of the ball that you're familiar with the most. And that's on the offensive side of the ball. You figure that you can get a veteran free agent on the deal, on a one-year deal or maybe go out and get some guys uh, late in the draft that can come in and be a great addition to the team. But, I mean, you, you have to dance with the person that got you there. And in this case for San Francisco, it is your offense. Right. And they also fired Steve Wilkes after the Super Bowl, which was a strange one. I guess we're we're reading the tea leaves and seeing that Obviously, things weren't quite as stable as they were with your guy, D'Amico Ryans. There's a reason why he was on the short list for uh, NFL Coach of the Year. Um, So building that stability and understanding the personnel, before you can do all that, you have to have the right coach in place. Is that right, Nick? Well, you do. And right now, understanding the type of defense that Kyle's been around, you got to go back to his days with the Atlanta Falcons and being around Dan Quinn. Mm -hmm. Dan Quinn came from Seattle. And who was the D coordinator before Dan Quinn and Dan Quinn was under? Gus Bradley. That, that's where Robert Sala learned the defense himself. So you had Sala, you had D'Amico Ryans, and you had Steve Wilkes. 
coming in trying to run a version of what Robert Soller uh, actually produced as a defensive coordinator. And now word is the next guy to land a job is probably Brandon Staley. And guess what? He landed on the Vic Fangio. So it's the same type of defense where they want to play zone behind and try to get pressure up front. And once again, we just talked about it. I mean, where are you leaning towards? Ayuk or the defensive front? Kyle's mm-hmm. going to lean offense all day, every day, and try to make a patchwork uh, defense. And as long as you have Nick Bosa and Eric Armstead on the contract, then you figure as though you can put pieces anywhere on that defense and still be successful. This could just end up being a Patrick Mahomes problem, and we'll get to the Chiefs momentarily. But when you view these two um, successful runs with the 49ers, you have the two Super Bowl appearances in 19 and this past uh, week in 24 versus Jim Harbaugh's Niners three straight NFC Championship games from 2011 to 2013 with that Super Bowl appearance, losing to his brother John. Would you say that there are similarities in how these teams have had successful run-ups and how they're built, but also they're running just up against better opponents? Maybe it's just not cut out for them. Well, the thing with these two teams is it goes back to culture. What do you have in Kansas City? You have a culture, you have a quarterback, and you have a great mix with Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes. You look in San Francisco, while Kyle has gone through different quarterbacks, he now has his guy and Mr. Relvin and Brock Purdy, but now there's pieces around it, right? I mean, when you look at how both San Francisco and Kansas City are constructed offensively, this is almost mere images because they have mm. impact players at key positions, running back, tight end. With the exception of Kansas City, not so much the wide receiver position, but as long as you have 15 as your quarterback, you can basically have almost any anyone because this was – by far the worst statistical year for Patrick Mahomes, and guess what? They won right. the third Super Bowl. So That's right. th- that tells you a lot about the culture and the design of the offense and the play call. Well, let's give some credit to that defense, too, which across the board, some of the best statistical numbers in terms of supporting you know, that, that uneasy offense that finally got things clicking at the right time. And I think because they're the champions, I think that because they've won back-to-back, it just boils down to this. This is, you know, behind finding more weapons for Patrick Mahomes, which they could end up doing in the draft or anything. I think the biggest question for me that I wanted to pick your brain about is the two superstars for that defense that are both becoming free agents. Legereus Sneed, Chris Jones. They could potentially pay one and tag another, but let's say in this scenario, Nick, you can only pick one. Are you going to take the, the corner or the defensive tackle or edge, whatever you want to call Chris Jones, because both of them were just superstars throughout this Super Bowl championship run. doesn't happen without either of them, let alone both. Yeah. Now, uh, honestly, man, I know uh, Chris Jones has done a hell of a job. So my first impulse is to go Chris Jones, but then logic kicks in. Now we're right. talking about you're a safety. Teams. You have to pick the corner. I get it. Yeah, no, but when you look at the, the money, <laughs> you look at the money aspect of it, right? Uh, you know, the franchise tag for Chris Jones is going to be around $32 million. Mm-hmm. For Ladarius Sneed, that's more like 18. So that's in the ballpark of the, the Kansas City Chiefs, who, oh, by the way, when you look at the cap space available, they really don't have that much. They would mm-hmm. love to have Chris Jones back. But if you have both of your corners coming back from last year, then that means Spagnola can play in-your-face man-to-man defense, and you hope that other guys can pick up the pace for Chris Jones, and then maybe you can go out and get another guy in free agency who may not give you as much, I guess, impact game record type of play, but he can give you something a little decent. But since you got guys who can hold up on the corner, you can do anything with your first and second level defense. So in this case, as it pains me to say, Mm -hmm. I'm going to go with Ladarius Sneed. That's the guy you want to bring back. All right, that's good to know, and we'll certainly keep an eye out and keep track of things because those are two names that certainly when the new league year kicks off in a couple of weeks, which, by the way, thank you, Bill Belichick, no days off for the National Football League. When the new (laughs) league year kicks in, those will be two of the names that we'll be discussing right here with those guys, Nick Ferguson, myself, Alex Hardy. Uh, I also want to spend a few minutes on the NBA All-Star Weekend. Um, It is... 
again, representing the city of Denver, uh, your goal is to get back to the NBA Finals and a, another championship for Jokic and your Nuggets. But there's just been so much to discuss around the lack of participation and effort in this game, and certainly the games that we grew up watching, where you rarely got to see some of these players, not not just on the same court, but on national TV, right? But now we have access to these guys, whether it's highlights or we see them on social media. Is there just something lacking from this all-star game itself? Um, I think it could be larger than that. I, I just got to ask. I didn't see a single minute of it. Nick, did you watch any of all-star weekend? What are your thoughts kind of on where the NBA is on what should be their marquee event outside of, you know, your Nuggets going to the finals again. Well, yeah, I did watch it. I couldn't help but watch it, uh, especially the dunk contest. I, I say really? it, 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 I say every year I'm not going to watch, but guess what? I get sucked right into that vortex. And, like, what do you do uh, if you're the NBA? you having the all-star break, and it's right in the middle of regular season, knowing as though – the season is already 82 games, which I think is far too many games in the oh. NBA season. So mm-hmm. now you got to, got, in order to get postseason awards, you got to play 65 games, and I have to play in the All Star, and I have to be competitive. Don't you know I am tired as hell, right? Because you guys don't want to give us low management anymore. Because if we do that, we can't get the postseason award, which means that mm. we can't get some of the incentives that we have. So this is a conundrum that the NBA finds themselves in, but it really doesn't make a difference because just like the NFL, no matter what controversy is stirring, people are going to watch and consume anyway. I, you know, I, I love to believe that if it was not too many games for the generations before, it's not too many games for this current generation. Um, and I understand, and Anthony Edwards put it best, this, this is an exhibition, like guys are looking to take off and, that's sort of been the understanding of this event for the last few years. And I wonder if it just has you know, more to do with the, the pace of games now and the emphasis on offense versus defense. And this is just kind of where the league is, is that if you're you know, scoring averages and pace of play, really, because we, we go back to you know, Jordan's Bulls and the Utah Jazz scored 60-something points in an NBA Finals game, you know, there, the, you know, every three or four NBA games today, it, it picks up an extra game compared to 20 years ago. So I understand the wear and tear and what um, athletic freaks, I, I'm, I'm sorry for lack of a better term, are, be, are, are capable of doing, puts more wear and tear and, and grind on, on the knees and other joints and, and critical ankles and feet and backs. And, you know, we see somebody like Joel Embiid be able to go all out and he can't suit up the following year. It just seems to be, you know, part of his body type. But I wonder that without a lack of defense, because scoring is what the league wants and guys score points, they get paid because of that. Defense drops consistently throughout the regular season. Why are we going to expect defensive effort in the um in the exhibition game at the same time though seeing 400 points is a little eye-opening and watching guys flub dunks and shoot from half court is just it's ridiculous it's not it's not it's not a showcase of the best nba talent you know it just it's not it's not how we should be seeing these players in my opinion well, once again, the NBA has too many regular season games, in my opinion. I, I mean, just don't know. I don't know, Nick. Okay, go back. Okay, go back to uh, COVID. Right, the COVID year, they reduced the season to seventy-two games. Mm-hmm. Right. So the idea, where I think about it, you reduce the games even further. Think about baseball. Baseball during COVID was really competitive because you only had so many games, and you had to get in contention right away. They need to do the same thing. And another argument is. What about the money, the marketing, and all that? What's which is the most important thing? Your players. That's why people are paying all that money and advertising your players. But you're telling your players, if you don't get out there and play, you can't be eligible for the postseason awards. Mm-hmm. And I still think it's a shame that Joel Embiid is injured and he's not going to be in the running for the MVP because he's not going to max out at the league's 65 games that they're supposed right. to. It is utterly ridiculous. And then 
how do you expect guys to play defense in an all-star game? They don't even play defense in the NBA anymore. Well, that's my that, point. That, yeah. Right? The whole, remember 90s basketball? Remember the, the East? Fondly. Fondly. Yes. Yes, I, I remember that. That that's what I'm used to. But this fun and gun and every team scoring over 120 points. I mean, I hate what the association has become thus far. But I don't know, Adam Silver. What do you do? Do you incentivize more defense and offense? Because most people don't want to see that. Yeah, um, I, I think the question that that needs to rear its head. And I'm going to get to a quote from my guy Jalen Brown, who's, you know. God love him, trying to save your favorite event of All-Star Weekend, the dunk contest. But, you know, here's a guy that's now the league's highest paid, and I say this in the sense that, you know, Derek Carr was at one point the highest paid quarterback, then Dak Prescott, then Matthew Stafford, then Patrick Mahomes, then Jalen Hurts, then Lamar Jackson. So temporarily, the league's highest paid player. I'm not going to make a big deal of that. But his quote from All-Star Weekend, when being asked about the 65-game minimum for the MVP award and, and other accolades which again you know he made all nba which is why he was eligible for the supermax we've got guys this is jalen we've got guys who play half the season and win mvp i'm not a big fan of that but maybe 65 games might be a little too severe maybe they lessen it to 58 or something like that a little bit less and if you reduce the number of games and then you limit the requirement of how many games to play towards um, you know, those awards, which again, trigger contract incentives for players within years and also make them eligible for those super max extensions. You know, if we're going from 82 to 65 games, are we going to ask players to earn 79% of what they could have on an 82 game schedule? Because that's the first thing that I think the players would push back and say, no, 82 games is fine. Well, from, listen, man, you got to pay guys what they earn. And, you know, all these professional leagues are making a substantial amount of money with TV deals, and now we have sports books. So I don't want to hear the idea that, well, we can't reduce the games and still pay them a certain amount of money. That's BS. I mean, if you're making money, they should be able to make money too based mm -hmm. on what they bring to the game. It's, it, there's not an easy fix for this, Alex, and it's a complex situation. But I still think that there is a way to figure it out because if you still want to play 85 games or 82 games, then you shouldn't penalize guys who don't make it to that 65 because they have injuries. And I think there should be some addendums to that rule that if a guy's playing well, like a Joel Embiid is playing well, he had a knee injury, he didn't play in Denver, and then the league fined the team because they said, well, he, he was enlisted on the injury report. Don't penalize the player. Right, don't penalize right. the player in that particular situ situation. If a player has accumulated enough stats to be in the MVP conversation, take those stats of the game that he's been in compared to everyone else. But don't penalize a guy because he missed a couple of games. In this case, it is a serious injury for a guy like Joel Embiid. Well. I, I appreciate your sentiments there, and as soon as you broker that with the NBA Players Association, I'm sure the guys over at the NFL would love to oh. use your services as you you know, put your fist on the table for those guaranteed contracts for those national football players, something that you were denied, but hopefully someone other than Kirk Cousins will be able to reap those benefits. Uh, I'm Alex Hardy. He's Nick Ferguson. And before we get on out of here, it's always time for Nick before we split. So this is all Nick Ferguson, and I just love the spirit. We haven't been able to talk uh, basketball here, yeah. so I think while we have you know a week or two here before the NFL rears its head again, uh, Nick, before we split, tell me about the All-Star Weekend that you just absolutely fell in love with and hold to the golden standard if it's the dunk contest or three-point competition or just seeing two players on the court together before that you hadn't seen on TV before? Your your fond memories that you're trying to compare the current NBA to back in the day? Well, for me, it had to be the skills challenge and watching the Pacers guys really uh, go to work. Uh, that is something that has become more exciting to me than the dunk contest because seeing so many guys – not be able to follow the guys who came before them and dribble the ball the same way. It's like, are we not paying attention? What are we doing, guys? We, I know it's all-star, <laughs> but watch the guy in front of you. So there's a little comedy there. 
but seeing guys perform, you know, in the skills challenge, that was great. But also the the, the three point shootout uh, with Steph Curry, I thought that was a uh, pretty pretty cool. Uh, so I mean, that that's the part that I I I, I love, and and hopefully, who knows, maybe get a rematch. Uh, well, not a rematch, but a, a do over with Steph Curry and uh, Caitlin from uh, Iowa. So that mm. that would be a, a great opportunity to see those two uh, shoot it out. So, I mean, amazing. Or you can highlight the WNBA and have those three point, you know, those women who shoot the three pointers, let them shoot it out. That just yeah. adds another layer. But it was still exciting to me, regardless of uh, how less or how low the dunk contest actually uh tip the scales but it's all-star weekend we're gonna tune in we're gonna watch anyway and your favorite uh dunk contest of all time is oh you know what the one with zach levine and aaron gordon where aaron really gordon was, where aaron gordon was robbed he was, he was. Robbed. yeah he was yes. yeah he was say it he's yes. nick ferguson i'm alex hardy uh, we are those guys. We want to be your guys. So make sure you check out us throughout the NFL offseason. Clearly, we can bring a little more to the table than just the pigskin. But if you're looking to catch up uh, anything geared towards uh, what the 49ers need to do to get over the hump or how the Chiefs can make it a three-peat or you know, uh, some, some quarterback tape I'm sure you're going to be grinding through for those Denver Broncos. Uh, anything with the NFL draft as well. Follow Nick Ferguson at Nick Ferguson underscore 25 on all of your socials. Uh, this man is grinding tape like none other, just going through any possible scenario. And hit him up, too, if you have any questions for your team in particular. So we are thrilled to be here with you throughout the NFL season. The games are over, but we're here for your fix as you need it. You know, that little itch that you have to see some gridiron action. So, Nick, until next time, what do you have to say? Let's go!